thank you so much for being here at this virtual international conference. The special guest is Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Nigeria and Suka, all the organizers of this conference, the presenters, attendees, and everyone involved. Thank you so much for being here. And it is a great privilege for me to present the keynote address at the opening ceremony of this virtual conference. And the title of my address is One Person, One Innovation, a mantra for a quantum leap in Nigeria's high tech industrialization. One person, one innovation, but it is permitted one person, many innovations. And I'm speaking from my office in Creighton University in the city of Omaha, Nebraska. And that's, um, those are students in my lab and um, more pictures of students in my lab. And my daily job, apart from being a Catholic priest, is a physicist. So I'm an assistant professor of physics at Creighton University. And it's time to go straight into the keynote. And the outline for my presentation is right here. I will give an introduction focused on the themes of high-tech industrialization. Then I will give some of my own innovations, not as a show of achievement, but as a token of encouragement. And then I will point out areas for your own innovations, which you are already doing, many of you, and just so that we come together then when I talk about the conclusion, how we can work together, harness these innovations and bring about that quantum leap in Nigeria's high-tech industrialization. And to make things clear, these innovations are expected to be at the level of scientific knowledge, for example, quantum theory here in red font, leading to things in the green font, as you can see, the engineering problems. So engineering takes scientific knowledge, for instance, quantum theory, applies the scientific knowledge into tackling, into addressing societal practical problems, converts such knowledge into practical um, achievement tools, solutions, and then in technology, these tools and solutions are made available as things that are actually useful to the wide population. For example, from nuclear physics as in an engineering application from quantum theory, you can generate power. There are many other ways of generating electrical power. And from the engineering that makes use of knowledge here, you can get materials that are very specific to solving problems. You can get things applicable to communication, quantum optics, lasers, such as we're using now. So that's the idea. Lots of areas for innovation, again, at the level of the scientific knowledge, at the level of engineering, at the level of technology. Now, themes for the high-tech industrialization. Why high-tech industrialization? Why now? Why do we need it? I am super grateful to the organizers for seeing our real need, our radical need for holistic development. We are, to say the least, underdeveloped in many aspects of human endeavors. And the problems that face us are so radical that we need radical solutions. And as the French would say, kiss, excuse, s'accuse. Whoever excuses himself or herself, accuses himself or herself. So the problems we face are problems caused by us, all of us. We are all part of the problem. And so let us all be part of the solution. Hence, one person, one innovation. One person, one innovation, of course, many. For a quantum leap, in Nigeria's high-tech 
industrialization. And let's be mindful of the fact that no one is waiting for us. The rest of the world is moving on, whether we make it or not. So, for instance, people are imagining the next hundred years of science and technology. So I got some of this from the New York Academy of Sciences, and you can read for yourself. We are still with Wi-Fi, that people are now imagining Li-Fi. Imagine plants around us being hotspots, hot internet spots, being engineered to do that. Imagine internet to pipe net. So the speed of data becomes the speed with which goods and services are delivered through a future pipe net. Imagine moving from being a consumer to being a prosumer. For example, some of the gadgets we use could rely on heat from our bodies to be powered so that we ourselves become sources of smart energy in addition to the product themselves. So we become prosumers. That's what people are thinking of for the next 10 years, the next 100 years, and lots more. So people are not waiting for us. That's why this conference is so timely. And again, I thank the organizers, especially the director of the Center for uh, Lion Gadgets and Technologies of the Department of Electronic Engineering, University of Nigeria, Misuka. So going forward then with the themes of this, um, of our virtual conference, let's show how appropriate those themes of education, of science, of technology, and of industrialization are fitting for the problems at hand. So the problems at hand have been well articulated by so many others. I picked just one of such articulations, and this comes from the publication, The New Economy of Africa, Opportunities for Nigeria's Emerging Technology Sector. This is the result of research published in 2019 by the Washington Center for Global Development in conjunction with the IMF and the World Bank, so basically the World Bank. So they have outlined here the various constraints in the business environment for technological firms in Nigeria. So they interviewed and surveyed many of them and came up with this graph. If you take a look here, a problem such as electricity we see the dark part, you well, know, light and darkness. So the dark part, major obstacle, very severe obstacle. You can see that for electricity, the companies in Nigeria, business environment, they report that 41 plus 16, that is 57%, 57% of people of companies see electricity as a major obstacle to their uh, performance. Compare that to corruption, that is 44 plus 11, that's 55%. So electricity, power supply is even a greater problem for many businesses than corruption. That's, so without further ado, you can see the list of the problems here. We are aware of this, we are part of this. And so the areas that we need to bring these innovations include number one, power tech. Of course, we need food security. So agrotech, fine tech, edu tech. So fine tech would be financial technology to help with people having access to credit for capital, for investment, for the industrialization. Then edutech, of course, educational sector, and I'm sure that um, the speaker on this has done a very good job to take us there. For health tech, it turns out that that's actually part of my area of speci specialization in terms of generating the scientific knowledge that becomes part of the technology. So I'm a medical physicist and many of my innovations are leading to that. So again, these innovations are not pointed out as show of achievement, but something to encourage all of us. We are all making innovations and we are doing well in general, globally. You see the list of speakers from around the world, many of them Nigerians, and many of you professors here, students, you have so many ideas in you, you've published some, you are working on so many. So 
let this be just something to encourage all of us to keep going. And I have selected just seven out of many others coming from my lab during my years as a PhD student, as a scientific postdoc, and um, now as an assistant professor in Creighton University. So once again, that's my lab there. And many of the tools that I use to make the discoveries and innovations I'm going to talk about uh, listed there. And you could watch this video again and stop it and have the details, but I will just go through very quickly. So in cell mechanics, well, here is the background. We all know Francis Crick of DNA fame. Well, it turns out that the first thing he focused on while working in the Cavendish Laboratory Physics Department, Cambridge University, UK, was to measure the physical properties of cells. So he came up with this result and said the physical properties of the cytoplasm is studied by means of the magnetic particle method. Guess what? He abandoned the study and took up DNA research. I think perhaps that was really good for everyone but he didn't look at the functional role. He probably didn't think that the physical properties of cells may have any impact on cell function or malfunction for that matter. And that's precisely what I took up, part of what I took up as a PhD student in the same lab, Cavendish Laboratory Physics Department, University of Cambridge, UK. Without further ado, what I found through mathematical analysis of measurements I made using an optical stretcher, a nice tool invented by my PhD supervisor then, was something that is now leading to new diagnostics and therapies in cancer because I found the functional and pathophysiological rules of cell mechanical properties to keep it brief. And you can consult the publication there. Furthermore, tissue mechanics still through measurements and modeling. The results provide novel strategies for regenerative medicine and anti-metastasis drugs, especially in cancer. And the third one is using digital holographic microscope illustrated here, taking phase measurements and making modeling. We arrived at non-invasive tools for analysis of candidate antibiotics and for monitoring stem cell differentiation. So basically using physical properties of these cells to um, track differentiation and also to monitor how antibiotics, um, how we can overcome antibiotic resistance by trying different types of antibiotics. So furthermore, microfluidic mimetics is also a big area that I worked on and continue to work on. In fact, it is the area in which the tool that I developed as a postdoctoral scientist in Dresden, Germany, that tool is now being used still in my lab. In fact, it is a tool that can be used in resource poor settings. As you see in this picture, that's myself and that's um, Dr. Yama of the University of Calabar Teaching Hospital. So we deployed the tool, the microfluidic microcirculation mimetic in studying sickle cell um, in the teaching hospital in Calabar. So it's part of what is called these days point of care medical diagnostics. And interestingly, point of care diagnostics market is projected to reach 46.7 billion US dollars by 2024. A jump, a serious jump, almost double 28.5 billion in 2019. So it's a huge area. And with COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, you know that this will continue to be big. So we think we can do a lot there, especially both where I am now and back home in Nigeria. Then another area is physics of innate immunity. The contribution was something that was exciting to the point that the press picked it up. Creighton physicist publishes new research on cells fighting bacterial infections. Well, that Creighton physicist is my humble self or myself. If, okay. So looking at the results, the, the results provide increased understanding of host pathogen interactions for effective antibiotics. So um, people are still making use of it. Like I said, you provide the scientific knowledge, it becomes an engineering problem 
which people can then take up and make technological appliances or solve real world problems in so many ways. So number five, physics of innate immunity, also taken up by the press here. Physicists and medics discover new ability of immune cells. So the physicists there, largely myself and a few others that you will see in the acknowledgement. So what did this lead to or what is this leading to? Well, our work has provided new insights on um, what is called COPD, which means chronic occlusive pulmonary disorder and ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And it presents new therapeutic targets for these clinical challenges and presentations. So quantum dots in radiotherapy and chemotherapy is number six here we're using quantum dots to improve radiotherapeutic and chemotherapeutic outcomes. And radiotherapy and chemotherapy are two of the three main modalities for treating cancer. So here we use quantum mechanics. Anybody who has done a bit of quantum physics can recognize the Hamiltonian Schrodinger equation. We solve for it and got the energy gap and we can characterize the absorption of energy, UV, that leads to the emission of light depending on the energy gap. And that emission of light allows quantum dots to become a sort of um, tool for imaging, diagnostic imaging, but we are using it for therapy. So that's why I say quantum dots for imaging, theranostics, that means therapy and diagnostics and some level of nanophysics that can lead to further applications. And finally, well, it's almost like terrestrial medicine and now space medicine. So space medicine, how are we doing it? There is a device in my lab that mimics conditions in outer space, such as the International Space Station. So this device was developed by NASA and it, is, um, it mimics microgravity. So by mimicking that microgravity, we treat cells with cancer drugs mimicking a process in which astronauts out there might be undergoing treatment if they are sick while out there in outer space. So, and the results are such that people, um, the reviewers of our work are excited because they think it is of increasing importance to the world's space agencies. So finally, now your turn, your innovations. You've seen that most of mine and my collaborators and others hinge on health tech, improving the health, adding to scientific knowledge. Yours, we radically need power tech, agrotech, financial technology, educational technology. And the good news is that there are many Nigerian startups that are already making breakthroughs. We know of Jumia in 2012, accounting hub, Life Bank, Andela, which is a software firm, Farm Crowdy helps farmers to kind of produce and store and distribute their, their products in ways that are more efficient. Catalog, 54 genes. So there are many there are people are doing something and it is time to work together. It is time to add to the science, improve the engineering, make innovations in the technology. Incidentally, even adding to the science, even making the scientific breakthroughs require appropriate high tech equipment in many cases. If not, you can't make new discoveries. So there is a kind of positive feedback loop in all three, science, engineering, and technology. And so we need to work together. And one of the things I think we could do is to also keep the human, humanitarian aspect, making things accessible to the poor. And so the first thing I said, let me really try to get done along with people is to establish, was to establish 100% um, free research hospitals. We have one already commissioned in Akwaibom State and two are planned for Cross River State. In fact, one is under construction already. So um, we, I work with over 70 Nigerian volunteer clinicians from the University of Calabar Teaching Hospital and the University of Uyo Teaching Hospital. And I'm highlighting this to thank them and to tell the world, look, there are many Nigerians out there 
ready to sacrifice for others, to sacrifice for others in the world and others in their country. So these over 70 Nigerian volunteer clinicians are not paid. They offer their services in our free medical facilities. The one here shown was commission, commissioned in 2018. And since then, we've given free health care to 7,103 as a last month and the healthcare is comprehensive absolutely free so there are people out there ready to sacrifice and i thank them so much it is a pleasant surprise so working together with humanitarian motivation can really be a way forward in terms of the high-tech industrialization so how do we harness our humanitarian um, motivation our scientific expertise, our engineering and the technological know-how to get Nigeria there. Well, uh, there are many ways to do it, but one is what I now suggest, industrial universities. We already are planning one, so, and that one is being incubated in the Abuja Metropolitan City Polytechnic. I signed that memorandum of um, understanding in 2018 with Dr. Joe Okoli representing Abuja Metropolitan City Polytechnic. And the startup is inside the Abuja Graduate School. And in 2019, that's um, Dr. Joe Okoli and myself at Voice of Nigeria airing issues and enlightening the public about this industrial university. Some of the things that we are planning in the industrial university are quite radical. Remember I said at the start, radical problems require radical solutions. And so we radically think that the way forward in this, our industrial university will be to pay our students. We will raise funds and pay our students, but it will not be just easy for anybody to get in. It will be people ready with innovation or ready to make innovation. So no graduation without invention or at least some significant innovation. So we will emphasize production and standardization of goods, of appliances, of concrete things. You have to make something. So we will have um, processing plants, we will take seriously branding and marketing and those things that militate against people coming out with made in Nigeria products. Instead, they try to say made somewhere else, even though it is made here. So, and we use this opportunity to call the federal government to establish six more industrial universities in addition to ours in the six geopolitical zones of the country. And other people in the private sector are more than welcome to join. We think that together we will be able to attain a quantum leap in Nigeria's high-tech industrialization through our industrial universities, through our innovations, and through our hard work. Thank you so much for your attention and most importantly, follow-up action. These are the people I worked with in Cambridge, in Dresden, Technical University Dresden, Germany, in Creighton University. So science is a collaborative effort. And so I acknowledge them all and sources of funding for my scientific research. Once again, thank you. It's nice to have you. And I'm more than happy to take questions immediately during the conference or even after whenever you watch this video. God bless you. <laughs>